thank you for your indulgence. I thank you for uh, your attention and the attention of my colleagues and friends. And um, so I would yield back the balance of my time and with the conclusion saying, uh, God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Reyes of Texas for today and the balance of the week. Without objection, the request is granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, lead a special order uh, this evening in tribute to public employees everywhere and especially our federal employees uh, here uh, in the United States, 85 percent of whom do not work uh, in Washington. I hope uh, that my colleagues and I will be able to offer some little known facts about federal employees uh, today so that the word federal employee uh, gets a face and you know who it is we're talking about. Today I also introduced a resolution supporting uh, the right of all workers to bargain collectively, public and private workers. I'm grateful that Representative Donna Edwards co-sponsored this resolution with me and invite others uh, to co-sponsor the resolution. The resolution reminds us what our grandfathers, our forefathers would have told us, that, the in, that for a long time there was a fight waged be, after it became clear that individual workers uh, standing alone have little or no bargaining power uh, against some employer that they hope will hire her or, or in whose employee and in, in whose employee she finds herself. Thus rose and finally was legalized with the National Labor Relations Act the right of workers to form unions in no free society in the world uh, is the right to bargain uh, collectively um, barred. That right has been under attack for decades and the decline of unions in the United States is directly attributable to the difficulty in organizing workers today because the National Labor Relations Act is a figment of another century. Uh, I think we will see in some of the statistics coming out of of Wisconsin and, and out of the country at large that um, the decline of uh, unions today does not mean that unions are not prized institutions in our country and I will have some statistics that show that. Uh, what I think most Americans recognize is that they owe to the American trade union movement uh, much that they take for granted today even if uh, you are not a member of a union movement. The unions could have been content to bargain at the table for health and safety conditions for 40-hour week and the rest of, rest of it. Instead they led to the country in making laws that require a 40-hour work week, uh, abolish child labor laws, require health and safety conditions, require overtime pay, uh, encourage health insurance and pension insurance. Uh, those matters which began at the bargaining table now many Americans enjoy. And yet we have seen um, targets, especially pl placed on the backs of public employees. I'd like to open by giving you an idea of who a public employee is. By uh, speaking of 
a public employee in my own district, the District of Columbia. I don't know Anthony Hutchinson, but I've heard about him. Uh, he's an example of an exceptional federal employee, I understand. He's a husband and a father of two. He lives on Savannah Street in southeast Washington. He's a transportation security officer. And he's worked at the Ronald Reagan National Airport for the last six years. He's also a member and shop steward of his union, uh, which in this case uh, happens to be the National Treasury Employees Union. Uh, he has been named uh, the, uh, the, the Transportation Security Officer of the Year. He's received uh, uh, outstanding uh, ratings from his employer. He has been made the chair and vice chair. He is once the chair and once the vice chair of the, of the safety committee. Uh, he has, he's on a team that, that, uh, that has designed ways to keep transportation security officers up to date on techniques for identifying weapons and prohibited items through x-ray machines. Um, he served uh, on the emergency readiness team. That's a team that deploys within 24 hours in the event of an emergency or natural disaster. Anthony Hutchinson is a federal employee. Um, when you speak of federal employees, it seems to me we owe them at least the courtesy of, of recognizing uh, them for what they do for the American people. But you would not have understood that if you have been watching uh, over the last few weeks the episodes in Wisconsin. These were shocking. And many, I think, thought that, well, maybe it has come to this. Unions aren't very popular. Maybe people are ready uh, to bash unions in just this way. But look what the polls are showing us. The polls show uh, following Wisconsin, when there have been national polls about the standing of public employees and public employee unions, that Americans oppose weakening the bargaining rights of public employee unions by a huge margin, by a margin of two to one, 60 percent to 33 percent, even a slim, uh, only a slim majority, just a slim majority of Republicans favored taking away bargaining rights. It's as if Americans understand a right when they see one. Now, bargaining rights are, are not like the rights of freedom of religion or freedom of speech, but they're right up there on any list of six or seven rights that Americans believe uh, once you get, you are entitled to because you have gotten them democratically. You had to go worker by worker. You had to organize. And when it looks as though there has been a horrific backlash from Wisconsin. Indeed, now Americans say, ask, when asked how they would choose to reduce their own state deficits, having watched Wisconsin say, they prefer tax increases over benefit cuts for state workers by a margin of two to one. That is what Wisconsin has given the country. It has laid bare what a frontal attack on a basic right means. And what it means is Americans are not for it. We saw what happened in Wisconsin overnight, that through 
the tricks of, of parliamentary maneuvers, they were able to, in fact, weaken the bargaining rights of Wisconsin workers. Uh, there, uh, uh, there is going to be a price to pay in Wisconsin, I believe, uh, and I'm going to point to why. Uh, the present governor of Wisconsin came in with a six-point margin of victory. His polls show him seven points behind now. 45% strongly approve of his performance. The man has only been in office a little more than three months. Um, public employees unions, including teachers unions in Wisconsin, uh, now have favorable, positive ratings, 16, point high, 16 points higher than, than Walker's ratings. Um, the turnaround in Wisconsin, I think, tells us where the government, uh, where the country, uh, pardon me, is headed when they see the overreaching here in Washington and when they see the overreaching uh, at the state level. Um, the Wisconsin results are, pure, are just astounding. They fly in the face of everything Walker was doing. They are the classic backlash to, to overreach. Um, the state's population now believes that Walker should reverse course and raise taxes on those making $150,000 a year. That's by a 72% to 27% margin. There you have it, a kind of incubator of, in one state, that I think writ large tells us uh, where the country stands when it comes to public employees. Now, the national poll found, uh, not unexpectedly, the 71 percent of Democrats opposed weakening collective bargaining rights. But there was also almost a strong opposition from independents. 71 percent Democrats, 62 percent of, Dem of independents and only a bare uh, margin of Republicans were for weakening collective bargaining rights. We know that when it came to Walker, there was no doubt what he was after. Because the union, seeing that the state was indeed in trouble, had a huge deficit, gave him what he desired in savings. And still he would not compromise. He held his ground and in holding his ground appears to have lost his state. This is a turning point moment for the country. This is a moment that is sorting out uh, those who, who linger on the extreme from those who have fought to find their way to the mainstream. Uh, and Wisconsin is a harbinger of what overreach will reap here in the House of Representatives as polls in Wisconsin show it has already uh, done there. Look what we have here. The president already announced a freeze, a five-year spending freeze on federal employees in his State of the uh, Union. They didn't like that. But that seems to have whet the appetite of Republicans for more and even more. They come to the floor with bills that would furlough federal workers for two weeks 
would impose an additional one-year pay freeze, one-year pay freeze, and cut 200,000 federal jobs. There's another bill that would limit uh, the ability of federal workers to bargain collectively. The bills just roll out of Republicans, a freeze, uh, a cut in the federal workforce by 15 percent. Don't you think somebody would want to look and see who the workers are before coming up with a number like that? Uh, cutting uh, agency funding to 2008 levels in 2012, as H.R. 1 does, and then to 2006 levels for the next nine years, that would reduce most agency budgets by 40 percent. Uh, I see that my good friend, who has also co-sponsored uh, the resolution paying tribute to America's public and federal employees, has come to the floor, and I am pleased uh, to uh, grant her such time as she may desire. I want to thank the gentlewoman from uh, the District of Columbia. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm here today because I'm here on behalf of and with the 150,000 federal workers who live in the 4th Congressional District in Maryland. But in our region, in our metropolitan region, we know that there are some 700,000 federal workers just in the Washington metropolitan region who do so much to protect this country, to keep our neighborhoods, our, our communities uh, safe, to keep our food safe, to make sure that we know what the weather is. 2.7 um, to 2.8 million federal workers all around the country and around the globe. That means that they're not all here in Washington. And so I'm always, um, you know, troubled when I hear people who for the last couple of decades have just gone on an all-out attack against the great work of federal workers. And I would say to the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, I know a little bit of something about federal workers. I grew up in a household with two federal workers. My mother and my father both worked for the federal government. In fact, it was working for the federal government that really helped them um, become a part of the middle class in this country. Um, it was the work that they did as federal workers that saved taxpayers lots of money. It was the work that my father did in uniform in this country, um, protecting and honoring um, all of us by his service. And so there's such a wide range of the federal workforce, and yet some who want to go after federal workers, and I say go after and I mean that, very directly, do it without actually knowing what it is that federal workers uh, do. Well, I want to tell you about some of the federal workers in my congressional district. They are workers who work at the Food and Drug Administration. They're doing some of the most cutting edge uh, research there is uh, out there. They are um, looking to make sure that our the, the food and the drugs that are in our marketplace are safe for uh, children and families and, and consumers. Um, I want to talk about the federal workers at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, today in the Washington region and up and down the East Coast, we've actually had flood warnings uh, for communities, including communities around the uh, District of Columbia metropolitan area that are under flood warnings and watches today. It's federal workers who actually helped us to analyze the data coming from the satellite that was put um, uh, up into our atmosphere by federal workers um, that help us understand what's happening in our environment with our climate and our weather. It's uh, the federal workers at, the, at, at NASA who have taken, who, who took the charge that President Kennedy gave to them uh, to explore uh, space, to discover that new frontier, um, who've been at the cutting edge of all kinds of research that benefit us in every capacity. I like to say to people it was actually a federal worker um, and the federal workforce that figured out through technology and experimentation that um, they could create materials that would lead to the creation of airbags and seat belts in our space program and those are the same airbags that I know saved my life one time when I was in a car accident have saved many lives all across this country. Well, that's the product of what happens when you make an investment in our federal workforce. It's a federal worker 
who works at Andrews Air Force Base in my congressional district, looking out for the protection of the president and for diplomats who fly in and out of Andrews, making sure that we uh, safeguard the protected space um, in the in the this capital region, uh, making sure that we have uh, have uh, uh, an air force and personnel who are deployed to as far away places as Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, looking out for um, improvised explosive devices, um, uh, training um, some of our you know, great other service members, those German shepherds and other service dogs that we, uh, we see. It's the federal workforce that's, um, that's doing those things. And so I'm often shocked, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I hear people targeting the federal workforce. And l let's just be clear. Federal workers have actually absorbed um, and been willing to absorb and to take, not liking it, as the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia points out, a freeze that's been placed on their, on their wages, um, but they continue to serve. It's the federal worker, Mr. Speaker, who makes sure that that Social Security check and that disability claim and those veteran services are provided, um, not just in the 4th Congressional District in Maryland, but all across this country. And so when I think about the range of things that federal workers do that no one else does, it's really extraordinary. And people try to compare, uh, the gentlewoman knows this, try to compare uh, wages and salaries to wages and salaries in the private sector, but it's not a direct match. I mean, imagine if you would that we could get away in the private um, sector with paying an a top-notch engineer and researcher uh, $100,000. Uh, to, to work for us, but that's what happens in the federal government, even though those salaries may, may be significantly higher than that well, in the, the private sector. Well, will the general lady to just on that one point? I will. Because the, the, gen the gentlewoman is making a very important and much misunderstood uh, point with these comparisons between apples and bananas. Um, half of the federal workforce, I learned, work in the nine highest paying occupation groups judges, engineers, scientists, nuclear plant inspectors, that's half of the federal workers. Less than a third of private sector workers work in these same nine top drawer occupations. So when you hear these comparisons, you're not comparing comparable workforce, workforces. Um, private sector have um, categories we don't even have here, like uh, cooks and, and, and manufacturing workers. Uh, uh, so these comparisons that you speak of, uh, I'll say to the gentlelady, could not be more important to distinguish. We are talking about the highest level workforce in the United States of America. And I'll say to the gentle lady, I, I learned as well that there are far fewer of them than when I was a child. In 1953, there was one federal worker for every 78 residents. Today, there, uh, 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 there, today there is one for, 100, for every 147. How did you go from one federal worker for every 78 residents to one for every 147 residents. Productivity, this is a knowledge workshop, workforce. It is a workforce to die for. I yield back to the gentlelady. Well, I want to thank the, the gentlelady because I think it's really important for us to understand really who is the federal worker. You know, what is it that they do? And um, as the gentlelady has pointed out, our, our food is safe because of federal workers. Our, uh, the, the drugs that we take, whether they come over the counter or their prescription drugs, they're safe because of a federal worker. Um, when that prediction is coming through for severe weather that hits the middle of our country in the most 
um, oppressive way, it's a federal worker uh, who analyzes that data and works really hard and really quickly to get that information uh, out to the, to the public. Federal workers also work in some of the most dangerous fields, in addition to being some of the most skilled fields um, in this country. Uh, you mentioned the, the work the gentlelady did, mentioned the work of our nuclear scientists uh, that federal workers do in our laboratories all across this country, not just in Washington, D.C., in states like Colorado and California and New Mexico, some of the highest level of scientific work that's going on in the country. And so we have a skilled federal workforce. And you know, I was really shocked in this story um, that we've heard evolving in Wisconsin and the struggle of Wisconsin workers um, for collective bargaining rights, that indeed on the committee on which we serve in transportation, just a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at an, an authorization for um, the Federal Aviation Administration. And in that authorization, we actually passed um, a legislation uh, through our committee that would say that if you didn't show up for a union vote, maybe you were sick, maybe you didn't want to vote, uh, for whatever reason, your not showing up would be counted as a no vote. Can you imagine if any of us actually conducted elections like that? All those folks who decide to stay home for whatever reason uh, would be counted as no votes? I dare say there'd be a lot of members of this Congress who would not be members of this Congress under those kind of rules. And yet, those are the kind of rules that are being promoted by the Republican majority through our continuing resolution, through our authorizations um, that really go at the heart of taking the feet out from under the federal workforce. And with that, I would yield. Uh, I thank the gentlelady, and I hope she will remain uh, with us, uh, because the gentlelady is, is, is pointing up distinctions that the, that the public is largely unaware of. Some of these job categories uh, that my friend uh, from Maryland points to uh, ought to be instructive. Rocket scientist, VA nurse, park ranger, cancer researcher, uh, prison guards. Uh, it, it's interesting that the cooks in uh, the Bureau of Prisons are probably paid more than the cooks in the private sector because they have supervision of prisoners who also work in the kitchen. How do you measure that? You don't do it by throwing out a bunch of statistics, public versus private, and believe that that tells the whole story. Now, we are very pleased to be joined by the, the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, who we're pleased oh, to I welcome. <laughs> uh, from, sorry, sorry, I really do have Wisconsin. I really have Wisconsin on the brain, given what happened last night. This is uh, uh, our new member from Hawaii, and I'm pleased to uh, grant her five minutes. Thank you. Relatively new member, and I'm really glad to join the two of you in honoring and acknowledging the work of our federal workers. And um, Ms. Edwards and I sit on the same Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and yes, it was, uh, it was quite revealing to uh, uh, talk about the kind of changes some people were proposing to the FAA bill that would have totally changed the way uh, you count votes. And it is a way to count votes that doesn't happen in any other arena. And certainly if we had to count votes where all the people who, who were registered to vote didn't vote would be counted as a no vote, I would say that most of us here, including our friends on the other side of the aisle, would not be here. So that's, uh, you know, that's very telling to be the kind of perspective that's reflected in any kind of an effort that goes after government employees. And today we're here to talk about the thousands and thousands of federal employees who are doing the job. We're here to talk about the thousands and thousands of federal employees who are doing the job every single day to keep our government going. Who do we think keeps government going but our workers? And we need to acknowledge that, honor them, and every, when you go to the Social Security office, for example, as I have, and you see the federal employees processing the paperwork that needs to happen so that our seniors can get the benefits that they've worked hard and that 
they deserve. You go to an unemployment line and you'll see, well, state workers mainly, but you know, the, this is what I mean. Government employees are there doing the jobs they need to do to enable our working people, middle class families and um, everyone else in our country to get the kind of services that we pay for. And to scapegoat them as though they are the ones who are responsible for this economic crisis. Some people refer to it now as the Great Recession with a capital G and capital R as opposed to the Great Depression. But so many of the stories that we hear are about people just struggling to make ends meet, including our federal employees. They're, they're like the rest of us, of course. There are faces to all of these federal employees. And in fact, let me just tell you about some of the federal employees who have been uh, acknowledged in my state for the exemplary work that, that they're doing. For example, I want to talk about Sergeant Michael Schellenbach, who is a combat camera officer in charge of the Kaneohe Marine Corps base in Hawaii, and he won a Federal Leader of the Year Award. He provided unparalleled customer service to prepare Marines for Operation Iraqi and Enduring Freedom. Warren Au, who won the 2010 Federal Employee of the Year Award for Professional Administrative and Technical Professions, and Warren works in the Naval Facilities Engineering Command as an electrical engineer on the Far East Planning Team. He developed and implemented an electronic data gathering tool to produce updated facilities plans. The tool is now required at all Navy and Marine Corps installations and has greatly increased productivity and efficiency, saving taxpayers, that's all of us, a lot of money. Um, Bill Persley, he was a 2008 Federal Mentor of the Year and he works for the Transportation Security Administration at Maui County Airports. And under Bill's guidance and leadership, over dozens of officers have been promoted to lead, supervise, and, ma to mass and master positions. So Bill has a very calm and convincing demeanor which has earned him the respect of airport employees and leaders and he's had a significant impact on keeping us safe. These are just a few of the thousands, 4.6 million federal workers in every state in our country and retirees nationwide who have not only provided services to us over the years and earned their retirement but who are continuing to step up and you know, as we refer to so many of our com committees, step up to do more with less. And they've been doing that for years now. And well, I'm, I'm proud I, of them. I'm if, proud if of the federal workers in Hawaii. If the general, if the general uh, woman would, would yield, uh, I think it's very interesting that you have on the floor uh, members uh, from perhaps the densest part of the federal workforce all the way to Hawaii. 85% of federal workers do not work in the Washington region. Uh, now, now, Ms. Edwards and I feel fortunate to live in the national capital region, but we by, by no means regard ourselves as representative of federal workers. Every member has federal workers in her district. So when you are bashing federal employees, you better watch yourself. You're bashing your own constituents. Well, the gentlelady from uh, Maryland, uh, well, uh, want to speak to that issue? I do. I, want, I thank you for raising this point because too often we hear, um, let's cut Washington. Um, let's, uh, we, we don't care if the federal government shuts down because then that's just a bunch of federal employees when in fact only one quarter of federal employees work in the three state region that uh, comprises the Washington metropolitan region. Um, all of the other 75% um, of federal employees work someplace else. And I love this idea of exploring what it is that federal employees do because I'm often fascinated by the many jobs that they, they do that provide so many important resources for us. Uh, meteorologists, well could we do without meteorologists? Ask the people in California and in, and in these zones where uh, we have 
earthquake zones in, in the home state of your home state of Hawaii, uh, the gentle lady from Hawaii. We need meteorologists um, in that in that sector. Aerospace engineers exploring this 21st century and our new technologies and the horizons that are not here on this earth looking at things like uh, climate and planetary scientists science and they don't make a lot of money they may have PhDs a PhD aerospace engineer who works for the federal government probably makes about seventy thousand dollars imagine if you translated that and that skill level into the private sector and so I thank the gentlelady for reminding us of the, the fact that federal workers span the spectrum of job skills, but they also are in every single state, every congressional district in this country. And if the gentlewoman would... Could I ask how much more time we have? The gentlewoman has 25 minutes remaining. Glad to, to yield to the, the gentlewoman from Hawaii. Thank you. And when we think about um, the kind of resources in our country that everyone enjoys, think about our national parks. What a tremendous resource for all of us. And so many families go to all of our national parks. And guess who is the, who's there to make sure that families, individuals, all of us have a lovely time and who are protecting our endangered species, national parks. And we have a lot of national parks in Hawaii. In fact, one of them, um, we, you may have seen the pictures recently of the, the continuing eruption of uh, Kilauea on the island of Hawaii, which is part of my district. So uh, there, there are just so many areas in which we could not do without the commitment of our federal employees and, and truly to, uh, I feel as though they're getting picked on for um, um, basically political reasons and, and it's unjustifiable to, to do that and to scapegoat our workers in that way. They deserve just the opposite, yes. it seems to me, uh, far from scapegoating. It seems to me we ought to stand up and salute federal, federal employees for what they're doing for this country now. And, and you mentioned, Ms. Edwards, um, about um, exploration and meteorologists. Well, the, the astronaut program, you know, where we went to the moon, that's a federal program. And we had a wonderful astronaut from Hawaii, Ellison Onizuka, who tragically lost his life uh, in the Challenger disaster. And so these are all... Uh, a, you know, this, this is part of what we need to do to educate all of us and, and the young people and our students. In fact, I was visited by a group of students from my district uh, yesterday, and they're here with the close-up program, and here, they were here to learn about the federal government and what keeps the federal government going. It's not just us. <laughs> it's all those 4.6 million people out there helping. Uh, Ms. Edwards, you back. probably also are aware uh, we, we, are, we hear about the best and, and the brightest. Uh, the federal workforce uh, now, um, with, with many baby boomers, is uh, eligible to retire. And there is absolute panic about whether or not we'll ever see a workforce as good as the workforce we got in the post-Kennedy period. These were people who came fresh uh, with, the, with, with all of the notions of the Kennedy era that public service was a wonderful thing. And they made their careers in the federal service. Ninety percent of them could retire in the next ten years. Now the whole world is open to them. They could go to the high-tech companies. They could go to Hawaii. They could go to California. Will we be able to attract the best and the brightest right when we most need them in an era when the country needs this side as well as in the military side the very best talent we can find. Well, and the gentlelady from, Cal uh, from uh, the District of Columbia raises yet another uh, really interesting point and it is that not only could they go any place else in the United States, but the world is their oyster. And we know that our best and brightest are not just being recruited from state to state outside of the federal workforce. 
they're being recruited outside of the United States because we know that we have the talent here and what better place to absorb that talent in public service than in, ser in, in service in, in, the, in the federal sector. And I'm just so proud. I think about the time that I met uh, a scientist, a researcher, over at the um, National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And let me tell you what they do at NIST. Um, any, any piece of uh, electronic equipment that you might have, and maybe it's in your doctor's office and it's an MRI machine, or maybe it is um, it's something, an, a, a piece of uh, a, your home equipment in, in your home, and maybe it's the iron or it's the toaster or it's the microwave. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology set a standard for industry for those products and test those to meet uh, standards. It means that no matter where you go, uh, no matter what store you shop in, that that equipment is calibrated in the same way. Now, you may not think that matters for a toaster, but it surely matters for an MRI uh, machine. And so those are the kinds of jobs that our federal employees do. And those are jobs that you really can't translate into the private sector, but that are so necessary uh, to safeguard the public. That's such an important point about translating them. You know, uh, unlike, the, uh, uh, unlike what the federal government is required to do, the people who've been throwing around the comparisons don't do what the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uh, does. Now, this is very, very difficult work. What, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics compares workers in the public and private sector. They have to, for example, look beyond the title uh, budget analyst. In the federal government, they may be dealing with a budget analyst which has o who has oversight over multi-million dollar agency budgets. Uh, in the private sector, that may be somebody who is sitting in an office pushing papers. They're qualified, but nowhere near the same kind of responsibility. Uh, what the Bureau of Labor Statistics does, and only the government can do this because it, only the government has the resources, is to literally get into the weeds so that when you see the government statistics, those are the statistics to be trusted. Uh, I, I've got to ask my good friend uh, to, to, to help me as well on one of the, one of the great distortions, and that is uh, on federal uh, benefits. I think most... Americans don't know that federal employees pay for 30% of the cost of their health care. Uh, if you get dental and vision, you pay 100%. Um, if you have group life insurance, the employee pays 66% of the pre premium and it, the full cost of any additional coverage. If you have, and many employees now have, federal uh, long-term uh, care, 100 percent. The federal government is, uh, yes, it, it, it is a decent employer. It is by no means an overly generous employer. Just compare that to Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 employers, and see if these employees who pay 30 percent of their health care premium are uh, are, are coddled. I don't think so. Uh, another, another issue that, that is often raised is, is contractors. One of the most astounding things about the federal workforce, and we are for some things should be done by contracting out, uh, but there are more contracted, contracted federal employees than there are federal employees. So that when you are attacking federal employees, you're attacking people who work in the agencies, who, are, who work, uh, as, as my two uh, colleagues have spoken in detail, uh, uh, who work as, as the park ranger, who work as the rocket scientist. But the invisible workforce uh, are uh, the contracting workforce. Uh, at the Department of Homeland Security, for example, uh, we have 188,000 employees, but there are 200,000 contracting employees working for the agency. So if the public really wants to know where the money goes, they shouldn't be uh, targeting 
the employee who stands up has USA written across her chest, is proud to work for the federal government. They should look at the entire workforce, which turns out to be many, many contracted workers. It's interesting to note that the president uh, is cutting the number of contracted workers and expects to save $40 billion annually by, in fact, bringing that work in-house so we know who's performing it, we can measure them, we can get rid of the work we don't need. You contract the work out, it's gone, and it gets a life of, of its own. Well, and I think the, uh, if the gentlewoman would yield, please yield. Um, I think that you raise such a, a, you know, an amazing point for the American people on two points. One about federal benefits. Um, there is this wide assumption across the country that federal workers don't contribute to their own health and life insurance and their dental insurance, and it's just not true. And so I think it's really important for us to debunk that right now. And as you say, the federal government is a decent employer, but it is no means the best employer when it comes to providing benefits as some of those uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies that you uh, point to. Uh, nonetheless, it's the federal worker who contributes to her own benefits, contributes to her pension, contributes to um, her health insurance, contributes to, for her family members um, across the board. Um, the the gentlelady also also uh, makes an important distinction for us to know that in fact the federal workforce because they sometimes work alongside contract employees who are paid different rates who have different benefits but are in some cases doing very very similar kind of work and I, I applaud the Obama administration for trying to get a handle on what is uniquely government work and shouldn't be contracted out because we re need much greater oversight. Um, I know I, I, I mentioned earlier to the gentlelady that I come from a family of, of federal workers and I'm going to tell you about one of those workers because I bet if anybody goes back they would say that my mother saved the federal government a boatload of money. She was a steward of the, of the taxpayer. Um, she worked in uh, the Department of Defense doing military housing, overseeing contracts, and she would tell you in a minute if a contractor was violating a contract. She'd tell you in a minute if they were overspending where they didn't need to overspend. And she would save the taxpayer money because she viewed herself as a steward of the taxpayer as a public servant. And I know that my mother is not alone. She's joined by millions of federal workers all across this country who take pride in the work that they do for the taxpayer, the work that they do in service to this nation. And whether it's processing uh, Social Security disability claims or it is making sure that our veterans get appropriate medical and mental health attention or whether it's making sure that our airways are, are safe and clear, that our planes are landing and taking off uh, safely, um, are protecting us in our parks. After all, if someone gets lost, a child gets lost in a park, it's a federal worker that goes to find that child and reunite him or her with, her parent, with their parents. And so the federal workforce is varied, it's diverse, it's efficient, it's becoming more efficient every day. And federal workers are really contributing to the lifeblood of this country. And so I think, you know, for, for those who want to get about the business of cutting um, spending where it's appropriate, let's do that responsibly. But let's not make the federal worker the scapegoat for budget cutting and for um, uh, ending deficit spending. Let's continue a strong and vigorous federal workforce that really is working to the best benefit of the taxpayer. This is such an important point, I say to my friend uh, from Maryland, uh, because remember in Wisconsin, the, federal, the, the, the public employee said, look, we will do our share and yet the governor insisted upon going at collective bargaining. Anyone who thinks that public employees are not willing to do their share do not understand 
how unions operate, if you have a workforce that needs to be downsized, if you have a workforce that needs to give up some of what it has for a period of time, the best way to deal with that workforce is through an agent that the workers trust. If the employer has no agent and simply goes in and does it, that, that, that becomes a, 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 a deflating, uh, immoral, a sapping uh, exercise. Uh, it, uh, unions are very sophisticated. Uh, unions operate within uh, our capitalist system. They know when there's money on the table and when there is not. Uh, unions are said to have been the major um, agent in creating the American middle class. Well, what do we mean by that? After all, there were businesses who, who and automobile companies and managers. What we mean by it is that when that money was coming, when that revenue was coming to business, it was sitting across from a union who said, workers help produce this product. The revenue from this product should be shared with workers. Out of that came the great American middle class. That is why an automobile worker, for example, who didn't have a college education, uh, could get a pension and could support a uh, family. And unions did this, yes, across the bargaining table, but in doing it for their own members. They spread it through the society because then competitors uh, had to meet the union wage. And so what happened was you got a great American middle class that you did not have before the, the unionization of, of American workers. And they deserve credit for that. Unions deserve credit for that. They don't deserve to be bashed. And, and I have to say to my good friend, I was never so uh, uh, um, uh, gratified to read what the polls show us. And I indicated some of those figures when we began this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, special uh, hour, that two to one, Americans oppose weakening the bargaining rights of public employees after all that has happened in Wisconsin. Instead of their reaping the whirlwind for it, American people understand what it means to take away a precious right, even a right some of them don't enjoy. Uh, and so they say they would rather have their taxes raised than to even weaken, weaken the collective bargaining rights uh, of workers. If that is not a lesson for the other side of this chamber, which is overreaching in a thousand different ways, nothing is. It is, it is a bellwether of what is to come. Well, I want to thank the, uh, the gentlelady and my friend because I think what you've done is you've brought the connection from the public sector worker in Wisconsin and throughout our states to the federal workforce, to the private sector workforce. And I think what we've seen over this last couple of decades, and I think it's evidenced in the poll and the support that all workers are showing for the workers in Wisconsin and for the idea of collective bargaining rights, is that we all recognize as workers, whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, whether it's state or municipal government or it's the federal government, that in fact, um, it's that organizing and the ability to organize and the ability to bargain that has helped so many of us to achieve a place in the middle class. And I think that there is a, an understandable fear of losing that given what's transpired over the years. In fact, um, you look at wages in the private sector and private sector wages have in fact uh, remained stagnant for about the last decade. And so you can understand that a private sector worker is actually feeling that strain, but they understand the position of the public sector workers, of the federal workers, and so we're all united as workers together to make sure that we can lift all of us into the middle class. And I think the federal workforce is particularly important because um, the federal workforce then becomes um, sort of a bellwether for what can happen in other sectors in our workforce. And so thank you for bringing that full circle. Well, uh, I want to thank the gentlelady for coming down. And you, you make a very important points about the stagnation of the American standard of living. It correlates with the uh, stagnation of the American labor movement. 
Uh, the stagnation of the American labor movement has everything to do with the difficulty uh, under the National Labor Relations Act of organizing a union today. When unions were first le legalized in the 1930s, they were encouraged. Uh, today, uh, it is very difficult uh, under the existing statute to organize a union, and I'm amazed that unions are still alive and kicking, but I must say uh, what we've seen uh, from Wisconsin is a national reawakening of the American trade union movement. I think the unions are going to be able to organize in ways that they would never have been able to organize without Wisconsin. Thank you, uh, Governor Walker. Uh, as I close this hour, I want to particularly thank my two friends uh, from, uh, from Hawaii and from Maryland for coming down to share this special uh, hour with us. We think we, uh, if the least we can do is to, uh, trip, pay, is to every once in a while say to federal employees and to public employees who appreciate what you're doing. Uh, President Obama perhaps said it best. Um, I don't think it does any good, he said, when public employees are denigrated or vilified or their rights are infringed upon. We need to attract the best and the brightest to public service. These times demand it. Again, I thank the general lady for coming, uh, coming forward, and I yield back the balance of our time. The general lady yields back her time. Under the speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Jackson, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me uh, first begin by associating uh, myself with the remarks of the distinguished general lady from the District of Columbia and the gentlelady uh, from Mar Maryland on a very thoughtful uh, presentation that they offered uh, the body this evening. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there has been uh, some controversy in the blogosphere and on conservative talk radio shows about some comments I made last week regarding my belief that every child in this country should have the constitutional right to an education of equal high quality. Let me be clear. Last week I raised the possibility that such a right might lead to an education standard in this country of an iPad for every child just like it could lead to standards of class sizes and athletic facilities and music classes and other important resources for our children. But let me be clear on a few things. These devices are revolutionizing our country and they will fundamentally alter how we educate our children. Mr. Speaker, this is an iPad. It's an incredible device, so incredible in fact, before I could open it up after I recently purchased it, Apple came out with the iPad 2. Mr. Speaker, this is the Kindle, a device from Amazon that allows you to download books and, and to read them. Before I could finish opening up my Kindle, Kindle came out with an even smaller Kindle neither of which have been activated at this time, even smaller than the original. Mr. Speaker, it will not be very long before every child in this country is educated using one of these devices or something similar. Why? Just go to your local Borders bookstore. That is, if there's one left. Recently, Borders announced it was closing 200 of 508 stores including one in my congressional district. If the recent history of the music business is any guide, then other bookstores and libraries, both private and public, may not be far behind them. That's because the future of publishing isn't in hard copy books anymore, or magazines, or newspapers. It's all digital. The iPad, the Kindle, the Nook, and other similar devices make it possible to access any book any periodical, at any time, any place. As digital downloadable music has gained in popularity, we've seen a fundamental shift in the music industry. Now, there are hardly any physical stores where we can buy CDs or other music products anymore. We've gone from the 78 to the 45 to the long-playing LP to DVDs and now to downloadable music. The same will be true for publishing. Books will soon become obsolete. So the school library will soon, unfortunately, be obsolete. 
Schools are likely in the future to use that space for more classrooms. Maybe it will help alleviate our classroom size problems, but for certain, architects in the future will likely be designing future schools without a library. Hard copies of textbooks will become obsolete. Instead of incurring the costs of buying them and storing them, and instead of forcing our children to lug around huge backpacks full of heavy books, we'll just download them onto a device just like one of these. Now, this is going to happen in the future. In fact, it's happening right now. In my district at Chicago State University, thanks to the innovation of President Wayne Watson, the freshman class of students this past fall every single freshman received an iPad. Over time, as new classes enroll, the administration at Chicago State University hopes that all students will use electronic devices for textbooks and to submit assignments. It could be a textbookless campus within four years. Imagine the cost savings for schools, President Watson said. Give a child an iPad, a Nook, or a Kindle, or any of these devices when they're in the first grade, and he or she could use it all the way through college. All the cost of buying hard copy books for the course of that child's educational career would be simply wiped out. Now, Mr. Speaker, because I suggested this idea, I've been called a communist and a socialist and any number of other things, but let me tell you why that's misleading and malicious. Let me go back to what I talked about last week. Last week from the House floor, I talked about the greatest capitalist in the history of our world. In my opinion, the greatest capitalists in the history of our world were the men who founded our country, our founding fathers. They were engaged in all manners of trade and commerce that ranged from farming cotton and beans and, and corn and even before the Constitution of the United States was ratified in 1788, even before the Bill of Rights in 1791, even before the Declaration of Independence, from 1492 until 1776, and certainly and even more tragically in 1619, 19 scared Africans arrived on the shores of Jamestown, Virginia, 157 years before the Declaration of Independence. Their desire for commerce and capitalism even had them trading people. They traded among themselves and with others across the world. And when they rebelled against the government of England and established their own country, they had a choice an unregulated, unfettered free market system or a system of government with checks and balances and regulations and rules. So much for the anti-government movement in our nation. Our founding fathers were not anti-government. They chose government, but they chose government with an overall structure of freedom and personal liberty along with regulation and rules, which leads us to the Bill of Rights. Mr. Speaker, the First Amendment is one of the great landmarks in human rights and personal freedom. It certainly is that, not only in domestic history, but in world history. It protects free speech, freedom of and freedom from religion, the right to assemble and to petition the government. It also happens, and often not talked about in our country, it all also happens to be the greatest economic program in the history of our country. Think about it. I asked the Congressional Research Service, and their experts responded by saying to a specific question, how many jobs in the United States of America are tied to the First Amendment? Initially, they said, it's practically incalculable. He said, any job, and I quote, with a public presence, unquote, could be considered protected under the First Amendment. And therefore, the Congressional Research Service conservatively estimated that approximately 50% of all jobs in the United States are tied to the First Amendment. Imagine, or just stop and think about it. Every newspaper in this nation 
and the jobs that emanate from those newspapers are tied to the First Amendment. Books, internet publications, every TV station, social media, public speaking, serious network, AM, FM radio, advocacy, lawyers, movies, CDs, DVDs, VHRs, VHSs, Comcast, Blu-ray, MP3 players, Democrats and Republicans, telephone services, cell phones, droids, pagers, music, classical, R&B, pop, country, western, hip-hop, techno, karaoke, the United States Postal Service, Federal Express, UPS, print advertising, Times Square, New York City, commercials, iPod, iPhones, iPad, computers, art, museums, photography, education, colleges and schools, theaters, plays, musical, and on and on and on. They have their basis in the First Amendment. That doesn't even include freedom of religion. The churches, the synagogues, the mosques, all religions, nonprofit organizations, 501c3s, 501c4s, charitable giving. All of this is First Amendment activity. Mr. Speaker, the First Amendment, with American innovation through time, from the founding of our country to this very date, has unleashed over time the greatest economy that the world has ever known. The Founding Fathers set in place a system that through our value system would give birth to more than 50% of all jobs in the United States of America. And that system has worked remarkably well for a long, long time. But now there's a problem, Mr. Speaker. These devices will cause the loss of jobs at bookstores, borders is closing, almost 50 percent of its stores. It's going to cost the, lo the jobs of, of librarians and libraries, publishing houses, printers, bookbinders. And where do we think these devices are made? They're not made here in the United States. They're most likely made in China or other places. And so if you're not an American, and you believe in the value system that emanates from the First Amendment, including all of the jobs that emanate from the First Amendment, and you're outside of America and you're looking in, you need only wait for American innovation as a result of our own freedom system to take advantage of selling to the United States at some cheaper labor costs a product that helps strengthen our First Amendment. It comes, however, at the cost of jobs significant jobs. So the First Amendment, the amendment that has unleashed such great economic activity and brought about such amazing innovation and helped America become the greatest economy in the world is now known for helping the Chinese economy grow and create jobs and prosperity and ironically challenge America's place in the global economy. We all know that our economy has struggled over the past few years. The financial and economic crisis have been devastating for many Americans. The unemployment rate still hovers near 9%, and in communities like mine, it's near 15%. Now, how do we turn our economy around? I have suggested, Mr. Speaker, that we follow the mold of the greatest capitalists and turn to our Constitution, turn to our bylaws, the bylaws of the American enterprise. That's what President Roosevelt did as he began his fourth term in office. Mr. Speaker, here's what President Roosevelt said on January 11, 1944, in his State of the Union address. January 11, 1944, unemployment is beginning to come down, but throughout President Roosevelt's administration, we see the highest levels of unemployment in the history of the United States, the period known as the Great Depression. But as we are coming out of that Great Depression, President Roosevelt, after having served nearly four terms as President of the United States, has some insights on how future generations of Americans must address unemployment. Today, unemployment hovering at around 9%. Let's hear what our President had to say. 
He said, it is now our duty to begin to lay the plans and determine the strategy for winning of a lasting peace and the establishment of an American standard of living higher than we have ever known before. We cannot be content, no matter how high the general standard of living may be, if some fraction of our people, January 11, 1944, whether it be one-third or one-fifth or one-tenth, is ill-fed, ill-clothed, ill-housed, and insecure. This republic, he says, at its beginning, 1788, 1791, and grew to its present strength under the protection of certain inalienable political rights. Here Roosevelt is giving deference to the idea that the First Amendment through the Great Depression is responsible for most of the nation's jobs. Among these rights, President Roosevelt says, is the right of free speech, free press, free worship, trial by jury, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. They were our rights to life and liberty. As our nation has grown in size and stature, however, the president acknowledges, as our industrial economy has expanded, these political rights proved inadequate to assure us, that is, every American, equality in the pursuit of happiness. We've come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Quote, necessitous men are not free men, unquote. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made of. In our day, these economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second Bill of Rights under which new bases of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. Among these, he says, the right to a job, the right to earn enough food to provide for one's family, the right to every farmer to raise and sell their products, the right of every businessman, large and small, the right of every family to a decent home, the right of adi to adequate medical care, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age and sickness and accident and unemployment, the right to a good education, all of these rights. And after this war is won, he said, they spell security. We must be prepared to move forward, forward through time, a time that President Roosevelt himself would not live to see, for the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. America's own rightful place in the world depends in large part upon how fully these rights and similar rights are carried into practice by our citizens. Mr. Speaker, what if we amended the Constitution, if we amended the bylaws of America to include the right of every citizen to an education of equal high quality? What would that do for architects and roofers and bricklayers and manufacturers as school districts across this country seek to meet the equal high quality standard by building new schools and improving existing ones? What would it do for the NASDAQ as schools improve their technology, technological capabilities with laptops and computers and iPads and Nooks and Kindles and other devices? There are 60 million children in the nation's public school systems, 60 million. I believe that, like the First Amendment, over time, an amendment guaranteeing every American the right to a quality education for all students would provide a huge economic boost for our country, just like the First Amendment at the inception of our country is responsible for 50% of all jobs if we truly want to compete with China, with India, with other countries around the world, if we truly want a population that is better educated than any other population on planet Earth, capable of paying more taxes, eliminating unemployment, rebuilding schools, rebuilding bridges, rebuilding hope in our communities, and by definition, every time we build a newer first-class school, we change the property values of every home around that school. In America, we just don't sell housing anymore. We sell housing plus schools at the same time. I wish every member of Congress, Mr. Speaker, in my home state, would visit New Trier in the northwest suburbs. New Trier High School represents quality of education that is provided unlike any other high school in the nation. There are state-of-the-art classrooms with small class sizes. 
It has top quality athletic facilities, and two, including two aquatic centers. That's swimming. The school rents it out for fees, raising revenue to help offset some of its costs. There are 17 varsity athletic teams for boys and 17 varsity athletic teams for girls. New Trier is noted for its drama, for its music, for its visual arts programs. Students are given the opportunity to develop all of the aspects of their talent. They are given full educational experience that molds boys and girls into young men and women. The academics at New Trier are unrivaled. In 2006, the mean SAT verbal score was 620, and the mean SAT math score was 650, meaning that 1370 was an average score at New Trier. The school literally churns out Ivy Leaguers. Mr. Speaker, I think we need new, more New Triers. We need all of our schools to have the facilities, the resources, the rigor of New Trier. I certainly need it in my congressional district on the south side of Chicago. And if there's somewhere, someone out there in America who wishes they had a school like that in their congressional district, I wish they would just go touch their television set, Mr. Speaker, and say amen. But we can't get there, Mr. Speaker, under local property tax regimes that fund our schools. In the 50 states and the territories, there are 95,000 public schools in 15,000 school districts, in 20,000 cities, all different, all separate, all unequal, and all funded differently. At New Trier, roughly $15,000 is spent on every child per year, which is nearly double the state's average. That's because New Trier is located in one of the wealthiest areas in my state and therefore has the resources to fund such a high-quality education. Now, I don't want to take, Mr. Speaker, anything from New Trier. My vision on the floor of this Congress is that the United States of America should be building 95,000 New Triers across our country. That's 95,000 schools putting millions of Americans to work in high-quality education for as long as there is in America not for the 112th Congress, not for the 113th Congress, but for all of these Congress, Congresses, and there have been 112 Congresses that have made the First Amendment responsible for 51% of all jobs in this nation. It has taken 112 Congresses for 51% of all jobs to be vested in the First Amendment. Now, what's the great thing about my amendment? The jobs that are associated with building 95,000 schools are not likely to end up in Beijing because building schools has something to do with putting Americans to work. That's very different than building iPads or using First Amendment values that tend to leave our own country, and yes, they spread goodwill throughout the world, but it takes our quality of life and our standard of living with them. And that's what Mr. Roosevelt is talking about. I mean, he is the president that had to address unemployment. So what Roosevelt is looking for are jobs with domestic content. But he recognizes that the Constitution of the United States, however much we honor it, it is insufficient on the question of economic rights for all Americans to ensure that future generations of Americans will be the beneficiary of the highest possible education standard that the world has ever known. As I've said, Mr. Speaker, it will create new jobs over time as teachers are hired to provide that high quality education and schools are built and rebuilt and technology is purchased and maintained that will unleash over time immense economic capitalistic activity that will drive job creation and corporate profits for generations to come. Yes, Mr. Speaker, there will be a cost. But Mr. Speaker, if we can find money for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, if we can find money to bail out Wall Street, if, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, we can find money to put a man on the moon, then we ought to be able to find money to put a man and a woman on their own two feet right here in America and guarantee our children an equal high-quality education like that of Nutrier. Mr. Speaker, only the Constitution of the United States can guarantee that kind of education system and at the same time unleash incredible job growth and economic activity. Now, with the few minutes that I have remaining, I've been uh, dedicating my uh, 
this session of Congress to unemployed. A lot of unemployed people have been sending me their resumes and the cost of inputting their resumes into the House record for which I am asking them to continue to send me their resumes and stories is astronomical. And I wonder sometimes, Mr. Speaker, why the congressional record isn't digitized, why we still have to cut down trees to print all of these speeches delivered by members of Congress. Well, the cost would be significantly less if the Congress of the United States would catch up to the nation's education system and start digitizing the congressional record. I'm not totally unconvinced yet that um, we're not dragging our feet into the future on purpose. But with that said, I want to read a few stories of some people who've been going through, well, a whole lot of hell, Mr. Speaker, in this economy. But these are the stories of our men and women who've served. This is from John Bridges. Representative Jackson, I appreciate your effort to show the country what's happening to the veterans by entering their resumes into the congressional record. A bit of background for you. I was raised in Tilden, Illinois, and joined the U.S. Navy when I was 17. And after 23 years, I retired in the Dallas, Texas area. I then went into the wireless telecommunications industry for over 12 years before being laid off at the end of, at the end of August 2010. I have not had any success with any position since that time. I have had one interview with the VA and an upcoming one with the University of North Texas. However, I have not heard back from anyone, so I'm assuming that the positions have gone to other individuals. Thank you and good luck with this effort, as well as your service to the Congress. Thank you, Mr. Bridges. We're going to do what we can, I hope, one of these days in this Congress to find you a job. How about former sergeant from the United States Marine Corps, Robert Green? Congressman Jackson, Jr., thank you for taking and thinking of veterans who sacrificed for our country should always be respected and honored the way one veteran honors another. My story is that after getting out of the Marine Corps in 1980, I landed a job as a welder working in Arizona on a power plant. I went to night school, obtained my certificate of completion for the trade I was working in, continued to use my benefits to add classes at the local community college level while raising my family and trying to live the American dream. After nearly 30 years of work in the construction industry, I found myself laid off. I had not completed a degree program, but had the experience and enough credits for a two-year degree in the industry. I had worked hard to establish a role of senior project manager on a construction project. Yet without that degree, most companies will not even give me a call. It is my hope that this idea not only heightens the concerns of veterans, but sheds lights on the college industry's business model that keeps people forever pursuing degrees that despite their personal life changes, nothing changes. Thanks again, former Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, Robert Green. Congressman. I'm currently a government contractor with the 505, 505th Combat Training Squadron at Holbert Field, Florida. We're undergoing a research management decision, RMD 8802, which included the realigning of resources for fiscal year 2010 and 2014 to decrease funding for contract support and increase funding for approximately 33,400 new civilian manpower authorizations, 10,000 of which are for the defense acquisition workforce. I and three other 30% or more disabled veterans are being replaced by workers and will be terminated from employment effective the 25th of February, 2011. All three of us have served our country for over 20 years and have been an integral part of the 505th Combat Training Squadron for years. It's, difficult, it's, a, it's going to be a difficult task to find work because of our age and our disabilities. I myself, having young children and limited opportunities for work, find myself wondering if I ever have if everything that I've worked for and the American dream of keeping my house and putting my kids through college has now become a nightmare. Thanks for promising to post the veterans' resumes. And I believe that even though you're not promising jobs, at least you're trying to bring visibility to the plight of our nation's veterans. Mr. Tracy L. Palmer put his life on the line for the United States of America. The least we can do is try and find Mr. Palmer a job. Good evening. My name is Thomas Gadbois. I recently read an article about this program in the Marine Times. I served in the Marine Corps from 2001 to 2010 before receiving a medical discharge. I was separated after having a seizure disorder. During my time in the Corps, I served as a radio operator, platoon sergeant, and worked in a complex entry control point while serving in Iraq in 2007. I've been searching for a job for over a year now, and my family and I recently relocated to Okinawa, Japan, where the job search still continues. I would like to thank you for starting this program. There are so many veterans out there that can be productive members of our society if the Congress of the United States would just find something for them to do.
And out of respect for your resume, which is going in the congressional record tonight, my hat's off to you, Thomas Gadbois. We're going to do what we can to try and find you a job. I served as an active duty member full-time in the 111th Fighter Wing of the Pennsylvania Air National Guard for over 20 years, Mr. Speaker, as an ordinance mechanic. I took advantage of the VA programs after retiring in 2000 to start a second career of information technology. I applied to all technology positions at local VA medical center as they were available. My application was not even considered. I never gave up and tried for at least 10 more years. In my last job, I was making $44,000, but it was just enough for the both of us. Now I'm forced to tell potential employers I will take a minimum of $15 per hour to get, just to get interviewed. I see American companies wallowing in their greed, Mr. Speaker, to outsource jobs to other countries because it's cheaper, and that's what we're getting into. Cheap products instead of investing in the talents and the skills and the knowledge of the American worker. This has to stop somewhere. Respectfully yours, Pasquale Filamoramo, T. Sergeant, United States Air Force, retired. And Mr. Speaker, they go on and on and on. And Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to request uh, a revised and extended remarks and to submit extraneous materials for the record uh, re relating to the subject of this special order, including the names of these veterans that I specifically uh, offered 